Good. Okay, my name is Jim Delmar, and I'm with the Engage Zero. And I just want to welcome you to actually the second public forum we had. The last forum was on environment about a month or so ago. Uh, really, really well done. And uh, we appreciate you being here now. I also want to thank Principal Mike Neverville for inviting us to the three of the Abbott building here. Uh, to make this happen. So we're very proud to sponsor this forum. You know, this part of the one series of forums really dedicated to inform citizens of Mary Sterile about significant issues, critical issues impacting the quality of life, mainly health care as well. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Engage Sterile. We're an all volunteer, non political, non profit community engagement association. You may remember the organization known as DCCL. It's been around for 20 years. Many of you may have seen that. We're on our email list. You're getting a lot of emails from DCCL. Now it's going to be engaged as Daryl. It's going to be extended out. Our purpose for Engage is to inform citizens of any significant or critical community issues and encourage citizens to become engaged to favorably impact. The quality of life of greater sterile. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Close to sterile. Right. Um, to achieve our purpose, we challenge threats uh, to energize citizen engagement, conduct research, and share findings, we seek opportunities and offer solutions. We listen to you, greater sterile citizens. We do that through a variety of ways, including surveys. And evaluate government plans and local activities and communicate informed and collective opinions to citizens and community decision makers. We provide transparency and offer balance to issues. We organize educational forums just like this to offer expertise. We also write articles that are very insightful to inform you on the community issues. Finally, we collaborate with other nonprofits and community organizations to strengthen your voice and increase favorable community impacts. Our vision, what we aspire to, is to have an informed and engaged citizen resulting in a community that delivers the desired quality of life. That's what we strive for. What we do, we do with purpose, passion, and pride in our community. So that's a little bit about the age of Sterile. I'd like to introduce the panelists now. First, Chris Bay is Lee Health's Chief Officer of Community Based Care. John Matingo is Lee Health's Assistant Director of Virtual Health and Telemedicine. Gina Tigar is NCH Healthcare Assistant's Chief Nursing Executive. And finally, but not least, Dr. Joseph Bay. He's a primary care physician and owner of Wellspan Medical Services, physician of regional health care system. Give them a hand for coming. <laughs> what I'd like to do is turn it over to our moderators. The first is Alan Bullish. He's Engaged Service Chief Communications Officer, and Carol Stevens, a member of the Engaged Service Communications team. So, Alan, it's all yours. Thank you, Jim, and a very good evening to you all, and also, of course, to our, our panelists. Uh, these people are, of course, uh, very involved in the many different things that they're responsible for, and uh, I particularly am most grateful to them for agreeing to come along this evening and uh, provide their insights on what I think, hopefully, you'll find uh, is going to be a very important discussion and some of the issues that we're going to cover. Um, I would ask you if you wouldn't mind, just check your cell phone before we get things started. I know that can be a distraction if they go off, so just keep putting them on silent uh, before we start. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Carol, who uh, Jim just mentioned. Uh, the way we're going to handle this is although we would certainly give you the audience the opportunity of asking the panel. Uh, your own questions in a few minutes. We are going to cover 
Uh, about five key questions uh, during the course of the evening in the first part. Um, Carol is going to give you a little background to the question, which I will then put to the panel. And uh, then obviously we'll spend some time on each question, maybe around uh, 10 minutes or thereabouts, so that we can cover these uh, five key questions in a timely way to give you the opportunity to ask your own um, so without further ado, let's turn to the background of the first question. So Carol, if you'd like to just take a look at this first point. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the there is a shortage of physicians, nurses, and other healthcare practitioners throughout the country. Uh, we have seen data from uh, some great reputable sources in the American Medical Association and others that uh, we're expecting uh, some, a, a real uptick in the shortage in the coming years, too. Uh, by 2034, the demand for physicians, this is nationwide. Uh, will exceed the supply by between around 38,000 to 124,000 full time equivalents. And the need for nurses is even more extreme. We need 50,000 new nurses every year to um, meet the demand. Now, as you probably know, uh, the amount of health care that people need generally rises as we age, and the need for health care rises as the population. Of an area of crisis than Florida. So the next uh, slide, please. Uh, Florida Hospital Association projects a shortfall of around 18,000 physicians in our state. Uh, in that same time period, about a third of them in our primary care, about two thirds of them specialists. And again, the need for, uh, for nurses is just huge. Thousand in the next uh, little more than a decade. Now, the, the data that we have indicates that this shortage, this shortfall, uh, is pretty consistent across the state. Uh, so, there are just certain cities in Florida or certain rural areas in Florida that will have shortfalls. It's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, so, the question is. So the question is, how will the imminent shortage of GP specialists and nurses impact the way healthcare is administered here in the next few years? And what actually can we do about it? So I'm going to ask the panel to address that question. And uh, I think uh, if my So, Chris, I wonder if you might like to take that to begin with, and then we'll see what other people may also wish to add to your answer. Good evening. Can you hear me? Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight to talk about this very important topic to all of us. Um, as we've heard, there is a shortage that will continue for a very long period of time, so we do need to do things differently. So there are three main areas in my mind that you may experience as a patient differently in the future. So what we started to do, because we don't have a lot of primary care physicians, is we started to build interdisciplinary teams around them so they don't have to do everything by themselves. So it would be probable that if you went into a primary care office now, You'd have a physician, you'd have a nurse practitioner, you may have a social worker or a psychologist, a nurse, a diabetic educator. So really trying to wrap those services around the physician so that he can direct and guide what needs to happen for the patient, but again, doesn't have to do it all himself. And really can develop a better size and scale of a patient base that he supports, so, or she. So that's one thing. You may experience different providers in the course of your care. That's actually a very good thing because each of these individuals is specialty trained in their particular area and they're good and they're helpful. 
But the second thing that we've experienced because of COVID is virtual, right? Whether it's a WebEx or through the EMR, telephone even. And it's interesting because everybody thought it would be all virtual after COVID, and it's not true. We've seen it drop off precipitously. We do have patients who want virtual visits, and we do provide them, but not as many patients as you might think take us up on that. So again, I think as time progresses and the need is greater, we'll see more virtual care being delivered. And the last thing I'll mention is that the electronic medical records and the technology through AI and artificial intelligence is getting better and better. And we now have programs out there where you can go in as a patient, put in your symptoms, get some really good advice back about what you should be doing for self-care or early ED and so forth. So I think as a patient, you're going to have to be very engaged in your care and really own it and really look for areas and ways in which to get the answers and care that you need. And I think there will be answers available, but it won't be the traditional one-on-one -on -one patient and physician in the near future. Thank you. Kiki, uh, would you like to maybe add some points to that? I don't know why those microphones on the table are not working, but <laughs> we can make you right. Hey, good evening. Um, representing the inpatient or the acute care hospital, um, just to throw another statistic out at you, in mid-2021, there were 3 million open RN positions in the United States, and that number grows by a percentage annually. So that's our reality. So in the hospital setting, we're doing similar to the offices. We're doing things that are creative so that we can extend and allow the nurse to practice to the full extent of her license using what technology is available, whether it be computer-based or hiring non-licensed assistant personnel who can help, help our patients bathe. Um, Probably one of my best pieces of advice and a big change from how things have been in the hospitals is we have open visiting hours. We encourage patients to bring their loved ones, to have that consistent advocate with them at the bedside. If it's not a hardship, it's really helpful to really help gather the information. The, the shortage is real. Um, it's not going to go away. There's not enough instructors in our schools. There are hundreds of qualified nursing candidates that could go to school, but we don't have the nurses to actually teach the classes. So it's not just the hospital or the doctor's offices. It's really far reaching, this shortage. So it's really about everyone working together. And I can't stress enough what um, Eric said, you have to be your advocate. You have to know what's going on and ask lots of questions. Thanks. Uh, Joseph or John, do you want to add anything to the points? Yes, this is, this is definitely, uh, I fight this every day, not only in the outpatient setting where I do most of my work, but also in the hospital because I also see some of my patients there. And I mean, I think. All these points that have been made, they're, they're excellent and it's the reality. Um, the one thing that I really try to encourage my patients to do is to, the daily habits that we, that we take upon ourselves as far as healthy eating and exercise, I mean, they're as powerful as medicine and, and they will help you stay out of that system if there's a shortage. I mean, not everybody can do that and there are things that certainly need care, but um, you can reduce your risk of, you know, heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and, you know, certain types of cancers by 40, 50 percent by just having sort of a healthy lifestyle, which, you know, takes a little bit of strategy, a little bit of intention and planning, uh, but not a lot of extra money, certainly a lot cheaper than, you know, going, getting medical care and cost of, of, of medication. So, I, you know, the reality is this is the fact we have not solved this nationwide and certainly not yet in Southwest Florida, although there's a lot of folks working on that. But that is one, that is one thing that 
you as a patient can do to take ownership and us as physicians and other healthcare providers can do to guide you uh, so that you don't need to be beholden to the system uh, to be ha happy and healthy. Um, just as a small question to follow up, I know that some people tend to be a little concerned if they are unable to see their primary care physician, and obviously they are asked if they would see their practice nurse or the physician's assistant. Can you comment on those concerns and maybe see whether or not one can allay those concerns? Um. You know, I think all of us healthcare providers collectively are trained extremely well. Um, you know, I feel as a physician who did three years of residency after four years of medical school that, you know, I think my training is a little bit more robust, of course, but I think that the nurse practitioners and the, and the physician assistants out there, when working with a team, and I've certainly worked with my fair share throughout my relatively short career, uh, when you do it in this interdisciplinary team and there is let's say I'm the leader and therefore I can oversee you know five different plans of care in one time because I have a great team I think that's important I think it's the continuity that matters more if you're going to see the same provider you know time after time I think that matters more than the credentials of the provider and that's the one challenge uh, right now in healthcare is that we have sent so many different levels, but also we have lack of continuity because there's a lot of change of you know, people leaving and before today you're going to see this person and the next time you're going to see a totally different provider. So you have to start from square one every time. The continuity, I think, matters probably more than most of the different, especially in the primary care setting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else that people want to add? And we move on to the next question. Okay. All right, I'd like uh, Carol to just uh, go through the background to this question, which I find helpful, I think, before I ask the, uh, the second question. There are several slides um, involved in this question, and, but there's one overarching theme to it, and it's consolidation. Remember a number of years ago when all the segments of the healthcare industry were really quite distinct from each other. Uh, there, are, there are individual practitioners in the very small practices, one physician or two. There were clinics that were mid sized, there were hospitals that were big, and very distinct from that, uh, insurers, and very distinct from that, um, the, the pharmacies. There's been a lot of consolidation over the last number of years, and those lines are no longer as distinct, and they're changing quite a bit, if you're asked to speak. Uh, the first one uh, we'll talk about briefly is that uh, a very large percentage of general practitioners, family practitioners, now work for large organizations. And you can see in this graph that uh, by January of 2021, almost 50% of them <coughs> And there was an uptick over COVID, but it's still even back in 2019, nearly 47% of them did work for a large uh, organization, a hospital, uh, even an insurer, even a variety of other organizations that we'll talk about. Okay, next slide. Uh, one thing that uh, I certainly wasn't aware of until recently was uh, how many practices uh, have been uh, consolidated in how many different ways. The, the original consolidation was uh, Kaiser Permanente. Are you all aware? Of, how many have heard of Kaiser Permanente? Okay, most everybody. It's kind of a one-stop shop, and it, it tends to be more on the West Coast, less in the Pacific, but it's moving east. Uh, you pay in, and then that that's your insurance, essentially, in your very large practices with a full range of physicians. So they take care of everything. Um, but various forms of consolidation uh, outside of that are happening. For example, the example here is an insurer that took over Pittsburgh area hospital system. Um, some hospital operators um, have their own health plans. I've seen that in the, in the uh, state of Idaho fund in Indiana. 
uh, you can buy into a health plan for a particular hospital chain. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then some of the really amazing workers that happened in the last, well, certainly most of the last five years, certainly most of the last 10 years, um, you all know CVS. And that has merged because CVS is one of the three dominant pharmacies in the country, and that's merged with the dominant insurer. They're not one and the same. Um, there's something called the Opera, which actually is owned by United Healthcare. Um, and, and many probably have United Healthcare insurance. It's a major, major insurer and pharmacy benefit manager. Um, they own Optimum. Optimum has purchased home health care, hospice care hospitals. Mental health hospitals, physician groups, target care groups, uh, cancer hospitals, women's health hospitals, sleep centers, and so on. So um, you can see how things are consolidating into no longer these distinct segments. Uh, again, there are other examples here like Humana. Uh, so that change is happening right now. And I think uh, Ellen must have focused in on a particular impact of one aspect of this consolidation, and that is the change from physicians being typically independent uh, in, in their uh, in their offices to be owned by large organizations. Thank you, Carol. So yes, the question really is, how will the acquisition of GP practices by large hospital groups and other organizations impact us as future patients in this area? So I'd like to uh, put that first to uh, Dr. Joseph Repay, who uh, perhaps could kick this off, and then others can obviously uh, add their comments as we go along. So, uh, Joseph, how do you respond to this one? Yeah, so this has been a very interesting um, phenomenon that we've noticed that I've been part of. You know, when I was in training, instead of going out there and figuring out a way to have your own practice or join a practice to eventually own it, your thought was, where am I going to get, you know, where, who am I going to work for? That is a lot more common. In fact, I think everybody, including myself and my wife, we uh, went and worked for the hospital after residency. Um, it was about a year and a half later that I went independent. So I've sort of been on both sides of that. And, you know, the idea is it, it makes sense. And especially when you're coming out of training and you have big debt. So it makes a lot of sense that going under the umbrella of the safety net of an employer. And I think that somewhat drove it because of the cost of medical school is, you look at the cost of education in general, of uh, higher education, I mean, it's, it's gone up faster than even health insurance premiums in the last decade or so, maybe 20 years. And, you know, so that's been just a reality. And then reimbursements have gone down and uh, maintaining office and compliance with HIPAA and all of that has really, become an expense that an independent office has, has had a hard time um, dealing with. So all of those things have led to this. Now, the positives, some would say, are, you know, it creates a, a continuity because there's an umbrella, everyone's under the same system, you can have communication, it's more seamless, um, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's what Mayo Clinic has done and Cleveland Clinic has done and all of those organizations that have been around for a long time. Um, the problem is, is it hasn't necessarily, the data hasn't necessarily borne that out. Um, so some of the negatives might be, well, when it's centralized, there can be some depersonalization. You know, you have one provider today and then you come back in six months and Dr. Jones left and Dr. Smith's there or a nurse practitioner, they left and a nurse practitioner came in. Regardless, you lose the continuity that we talked about. And what I've seen is what I call a depersonalization of primary care. So therefore you don't have the trust in your primary care like you used to because now they're just a bit of a stranger to you at times. Um, 
you're not guaranteed you're going to see them again. The average time to see a provider is seven minutes. Uh, the average time for a new patient to get into a provider is about two months now, or I think, or something to that effect. Because when you belong to a bigger organization, it becomes a more of a corporate structure, and then it becomes more production. Um, and that's been a bit of a challenge, and I think it's spurred some burnout in the medical profession. Um, you know, the other thing you see is when these things consolidate like anything else, patient choice gets limited, and therefore that sometimes drives up cost. Um, there's a Northern California healthcare system that became massive. It really became a monopoly. And if you looked at the cost of, I think they took a pediatric open heart surgery and it was like $150,000 because they, there was nobody else in that area. You go to, I think LA County and it was like 70,000. So they use their bargaining power to maintain their reimbursement as opposed to reduce costs for community. You know, if you're a business person, I guess that makes sense, but that hasn't reined in cost and it hasn't provided um, choice for the patient. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, when hospitals own doctors, someone could say, well, maybe that's a conflict of interest. You know, maybe if you have an owner of a team that's also the referee in the game that they're playing in, maybe some would say that's a challenge, you know, for the patient, for the, because the hospital can determine who comes and works in their hospital. They can determine who gets credentialed and who doesn't. And some hospitals, in fact, most hospitals, and, uh, you can only work in the hospital, have privileges in the hospital if you're employed in, by the hospital system. So again, it comes back to choice and freedom to use who you wish to use. And that being said also, when it comes to cost, is a hospital can charge, can bill a lot higher for the same service than a primary care doctor, uh, an independent doctor can to the tune of about $114,000 per year per doctor. So again, it really doesn't rein in cost, and none of these things have shown that patient care is better under those systems, but it is a lot more expensive. So there's a lot of reasons why physicians do it, and there's a lot of good ways, and I think there's a lot of hospital systems that are out there trying to rein this in, and they have a lot more resources to try to figure it out than the independent doctors. But independence, does improve choice. Um, I'm biased, I think it improves quality because I really get to know my patients. Uh, but I think it also uh, it makes your healthcare dollars go further if they are allowed to be utilized that way. Thanks, Rosie. I was looking smiling and I was suspecting that perhaps just to have a slightly different perspective on that one. <laughs> So I work with a physician group, and we have over a thousand important physicians and advanced practitioners. So clearly, on the other side of, of the discussion, and your points are very valid. I, I don't disagree. I think the value of an employee model is that it's preferred by many of the residents coming out now. If you are independent, many times you're running your own practice. Not only are you a clinician, but you're a business person. And you're having to run the show, and the finances are tough, extremely tough, as you've mentioned, with all of the regulations. So the reality is, coming out of medical school with high debt and not wanting to own a business per se, this is the more attractive option. The other thing I'll tell you is that the physicians coming out now want a better work-life balance, which is a good thing. They don't want to be in the office necessarily 80 hours a week, seeing patients billing and so forth. So there's a trade-off. Uh, I think the benefit of the employee uh, model, it is truly integrated into a multi-specialty group, is the communication is better. There's a common uh, electronic medical record, so the communication between the physicians tends to be better. And to your point of continuity, I think it can lend itself, if it's done well, uh, to better continuity of care. So again, pros and cons, the reality is, in order to get the physicians here and the numbers that we need to care for our community, the employer model is a really important piece, as are the independent physicians who really have been around for a very long time and provide excellent care. This is very interesting point. Thank you, uh, Chris. Anyone else want to add anything further? Okay. Uh, one of the questions, or one of the things I'd like to ask our projectionists to do at this point, 
even though we do have some other slides, and I know it's very disturbing for the uh, for the panel to be looking at this very bright light on the screen here. So if you could please stop the projector uh, at this point and take it, and we'll uh, I'm sure that's <laughs> going to be very helpful to uh, for all our panel members. So we we're going to continue uh, to read out both the uh, introduction to the question. And then obviously I'll tell you what the next question is in a moment. So uh, our third question is going to be uh, so preamble for it is going to be back to Carol. So. Okay. Uh, this question is about carbon medicine. You know, traditionally medicine has been the patient goes into a healthcare facility and meets face to face with the health healthcare provider. Telemedicine is increasingly common and is increasingly an option, and it involves using some kind of electronic media, whether telephones, uh, computers, video, um, to have consultations and uh, visits with a healthcare provider. It can allow long distance patient and clinician contact, care, advice, prescribing. Reminders, education, interventions, uh, monitoring, and even remote admissions. So, uh, thank you. Yes, so we have as our third question Is the use of telemedicine a viable option in the future? Although, of course, it has been used very extensively, as you know, during the COVID period. Um, but will it be continue to be used in the future? And how will the quality of healthcare be affected in our area? So I wondered if maybe John might like to take that, given that's I know a very important part of your work. So maybe give us some benefit of your insights. Thank you. Certainly. How are you guys doing? Thank you for letting us come out here. So let me give you a, a, my personal story, how I got started on the whole telehealth journey. My daughter had a fall. She was about five years old at the time. I've got five kids at home and we had newborn twins and my daughter fell, cracked her skull, started bleeding, screaming. Um, and so I rushed her to the hospital, Golisano, and brought her in and the doctor said, I have bad news. We don't have a pediatric neurosurgeon on site. So we're gonna have to fly you to Miami. So forgetting the cost, forgetting the logistics, just the challenges of all this going on, because we don't have a doctor. Again, it's a really specific niche specialty that we just don't have enough. We do now, but at the time, you know, seven years ago, we didn't have. So we've got to fly across the state to Miami. Well, coincidentally, about six months earlier, I had been asked to work on a project to partner with Miami Children's to allow them access to our system. And so that became the birth of it. I was actually, my daughter was the first patient to utilize the service. We went live two days before and the doctor was able to see my daughter's scans, see her, you know, CT imaging, all that kind of stuff and said, you know what? Great news, John. We don't have to transport her to Miami because I've seen everything. I've seen her whole record and you can get the care. I can coordinate with the doctors here locally. And so she was able to stay inside Golisano for a couple days in the ICU for observation, for changes in her care plan and her med based on the doctor being remote. And that's how it was born. It was really, I came back to work and I said, how do I do more of this? And so partnering with the doctors saying, what kind of activities do we have to do that are non-touch, non-tactile, that you don't have to physically be present? So one of those was stroke. We have neurologists and right now, you know, back in the day, they would have to drive. And I drove down here in the middle of the day and it's not fun to drive from Coconut Point up to Cape Coral. And so you've got one neurologist who's on call, lives down here in Estero, has to drive maybe if they're lucky during the day, an hour and a half to Cape Coral Hospital. Meanwhile, the patient's waiting that entire time. There's no value add for a patient to say, okay, great, the doctor's driving. They're not doing anything during that time. So you're just sitting there, you know, getting worse, the care is deteriorating, waiting for a physician. So that's where the birth of telemedicine came, leveraging technology to say, what can we do remotely? Ideal state, Dr. Rope, you know, would drive around to everybody's home. You would call, you know, back in the day, you know, 100 years ago, you got sick and the doctor came to your house. 
The challenge is it's not scalable, it's not sustainable. We live in too wide a spread area, we have physician shortages. So the birth of telehealth became how can we do this safely, effectively, and remotely? And then you add on COVID, it became essential to how we're gonna practice. So now it's finding that kind of stabilized level of saying, how do we get you the preference of, do I wanna to connect to the provider? How do we get you access to a specialist that may not be live here locally that we can't sustain from a financial perspective? There's just not enough volume. So we can access specialties all over the country. So the best physicians now are at your beck and call. And that's really what it is. It's again, going back to choice, going back to coordinated care and really connecting you so I can do the same thing, you know, I'm connecting with my family over you know, FaceTime, that same interaction. Now you start adding on peripherals and saying, hey, can I do biometrics? Can I do, you know, remote monitoring? All those things building upon it. Yes, I agree. Everything John said is absolutely true. And We've even taken it further for those other hard to reach specialties that we need access to, like um, psychiatry. There is a huge shortage of availability of psychiatrists. So we've actually recently tapped into that market using the telepsychiatry with some really good results. The, the person on the other end will partner with a physician that's on site, our hospitalist, to really make the best decisions for the patient. But in the reality with the shortage is we're going to have to be creative if we want our patients to get the very best care and have access to those specialists. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, topic. And I think all the points made were excellent and very, very uh, accurate. I think for me, I would parse it out into, you know, telemedicine is very different given the specialties. I think it works extremely well in specialty care, neurology, neuro, you know, neurosurgery for an immediate consult, radiology, uh, a lot of things that a lot of specialties that don't need, again, a physical exam or continuity. They just, you know, they're there for that specific incident and it's taken care of. Primary care, I think it's a little more nuanced. I think uh, when you have telemedicine, and again, you're speaking with a provider that you have no relationship with, they don't know you, you don't know them. Um, it's a little tougher. For example, when COVID hit, my practice was completely you know, shut down. Nobody was coming in, but we had a full day because we would go straight to the phones and then we went to Zoom. Uh, so there was a lot of continuity, The I guess, the, except you know, I knew my patients and they knew me, so there was, there was history, there was, you know, record, there was, so that it, we felt it was very appropriate, which may be a little different than if you, again, call a telemedicine uh, service and the doctor's in Iowa and it's just who's ever on that day, maybe a little different. You know, we have a big problem with antibiotic uh, stewardship in this country. We overprescribe them by 30%, which is a big deal. Resistance is a big deal. Um, ask any hospital system about that. And if you don't know a patient and you don't know if they're gonna follow up and you're the doctor and you wanna make sure that you're gonna cover it, you're gonna give them antibiotic. That's a proven behavioral fact. So primary care, that kind of medicine, it, I think there's a need for it because of the reality of what we're talking about with these shortages. It's just, um, if you can find a way to accentuate the leverage with specialties and try to get primary care a little bit more continual uh, that would help. But that's a challenge that I don't think anybody or myself has that answer. So, um, but I think telemedicine has a huge part in the future of medicine and, and around the world, really. Thank you. Uh, obviously, we're listening way ahead of you what you said. And, uh, you said that you me. I was a little unsure about when telemedicine is going to work and how it's going to work, but listening to your comments, I think that's how I think it's. <laughs> Uh, the next question is somewhat related to this one. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Carol again just to give us the background to this next one. Uh, a particular kind of telemedicine is uh, often called uh, RPM, remote patient monitoring. 
that can include, and people touched on that in, in the last few minutes. Um, you all know that uh, it is possible now for physicians and other healthcare pro providers to monitor patients in various ways electronically. Um, digital transmission of all kinds of imaging, blood pressure, glucose, uh, sleep pattern, pattern monitoring, uh, urinalysis, remote medical diagnosis evaluation uh, by all the usual electronic media. And it, it, it is amazing the way we can even monitor ourselves and transmit that to our healthcare providers, even a, my $99 fit this. Uh, it monitors my blood oxygen saturation. I didn't even want that, but it does for me. And uh, but much more sophisticated uh, means of Apple Watches to a lot. There are, are there are uh, uh, there are cardiac devices you can put on your cell phone, and those are just consumer devices. They're also much more sophisticated uh, technology that can be used by people at home. So. There we go. So, uh, really, as a kind of follow up to what we were just talking about, uh, the question really is how will remote patient monitoring, RPM, as Carol just mentioned, uh, devices that analyze patients' acute and chronic conditions from outside the hospital impact future care for those of us in our area? So, uh, John, given that this is somewhat related to the last one, maybe you'd like to take a stab at this. Certainly. So as much as, you know, our hospitals are amazing, they're beautiful, the challenge is nobody wants to go there. Nobody loves to stay in the hospital. I'd rather stay at the Ritz, it's cheaper, it, the food's better, it, it, that's the reality. So how can we safely give all that care with the patient not in our doors? And so remote patient monitoring is a way to extend the hospital, extend the doctors, extend the care at home. So now if I've got different vitals monitors, you know, Carol alluded to, you know, blood pressure cuff, pulse ox, you name it. There's different sensors out there. You can put a patch on that we can watch you, your respiration, you, a cough detection. So it, you know, recognizes whether you have croup or whether you have COVID or whatever it is. So now you're doing this while your normal activity is at home. And then suddenly you hit a level, whether it's, you know, respiration rate, O2 whatever it is clinically, you hit that rate, and now you've got a care team behind it. So it's triggering to the nurses, it's triggering to the provider, the medical director, whomever looking, saying, wait a minute, we need to intervene. At this point, something's happening where, again, you were sitting in the hospital, the nurses would come in the room, they see that flag, it recognize you know, the hospitalist, whomever comes in. Now they can connect remotely and say, wait a minute, before this becomes a problem, before you have to come back to the hospital, let's change your meds. Let's adjust your plan of care. And that's really where the future is. You, you, know, you may have seen in the news, hospital at home. That's something, again, you can do that safe care, that safe, effective clinical care at home for much, you know, fraction of the cost, for the convenience, you know. So that's where the future of medicine is going. Again, keeping the patient where they are rather than having to come to the hospital. Thanks, John. Uh, you know, if you'd like to follow this one up too, uh, just to back in my mind, I, I'm also thinking that while it's clear that the movement is headed this way, uh, we do, of course, in uh, the whole of Southwest Florida have uh, an older population. And I just wonder how some of those older patients uh, might embrace this kind of technological move. Um, I wonder whether you could maybe incorporate that into your response. So we use it on the on the outpatient side, but turning it towards the inpatient side, this is part of that technology I talked about when with the first question, and that it helps us monitor patients and extend the scope of the caregivers, right? We know the shortage is here. How can we ensure the patients are safe? So remote monitoring in the hospital is being used to monitor um, heart rate, heart rhythms, where it goes to a centralized area. It could be in an area off the, the campus where it's being monitored 
one person's monitoring a group of patients. We're also using it to keep patients safe in the hospital. As you discussed, the older population that are here, they um, can get confused, certain types of infections, um, being out of the home if they don't have caregivers with them, makes them a really high risk for falling in the hospital. Um, and our floors are pretty unforgiving if someone falls. So really having that remote monitoring, um, we use video monitoring. And I know Lee does the, a similar thing. I saw an article where the, the, the caregiver that's remotely can actually have a conversation through that camera to ask the patient to wait don't get out of bed while they call for emergency help to get to the room, right? It's all in an effort to keep patients safe. And then when we look at the older population, just at large, um, my mother has embraced this technology like none other. Um, she's in her 80s. She loves her um, remote monitoring, her, her telemedicine physician. Um, we still make it in to see her physician once a month, but overall they can keep track of her weight, her vital signs, even how much she's walking um, by use of her, um, her iPhone and her iWatch. It, it's pretty amazing the technology that's there and it's fairly simple for um, anyone to learn. I don't know that we'll ever be as savvy as Generation Z, those <laughs> youngins, but um, they're doing really well with it. Well, I've, again, as Gina alluded to, I have found that my patients, the average age of my practice is about 75, the oldest patient is 102, and even the centenarians uh, can use, you know, some of the the remote monitoring tools uh, very well. Um, in fact, we used it quite often <clears throat> during COVID. We would use the uh, O2 sensor on the finger uh, to get a sense of do we need to get you to the hospital or can we just manage this at home? I mean, it was better than how do you feel? Are you short of breath versus what's the number? I mean, it gives you a metric to go by so that we're truly sending someone to the hospital based on something that there's an objective number attached to our advice. So, and I think that's the biggest thing. When we're going forward and we want to extend ourselves with somebody that doesn't have the easiest time to get to see us. Maybe they can't drive, they, they don't have good vision or whatever the reason, maybe it's you know 10 o'clock at night um, and you just get a sense of, you know, you don't need a trained person to look and, and, and tell what the number is or what's the blood pressure that you're having based on symptoms. So even those very simple things that have been around for quite a while are exceedingly helpful when a provider on the other end of that phone or the under, other end of that Zoom to say, hey, what is that? Or if you're on a Zoom call, can you show me that? Let me see what your numbers are. It helps us be a lot more efficient and accurate on if we say, if we tell you you need to go to the ER or not. So very, very, very effective. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, our last question. That would be great. Okay. Uh, well, this, uh, we've come full circle. Uh, we've talked about today a lot about alternatives to having every physician or healthcare provider visit you face to face. Well, now we're at the end. How we can use technology. <laughs> now we're going to come around to new versions of actually face to face. Uh, meetings for healthcare providers. There are new innovative services for home visitation. Remember when doctors used to go to have home visits like way, way back in the Pleistocene era? Well, now we've got trained groups of uh, healthcare providers, uh, people like uh, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, medical technicians, um, and, and uh, many others who can treat a variety of situations and then we'll go to people's homes. Uh, so I will let the experts talk about that. And... Yeah. Yes, so my uh, last question, at least from the podium, is how will other services such as dispatch health, a home visitation service, uh, impact 
patient's care as we go forward. Um, Chris, maybe you'd like to take that to begin? Thank you. So, Dispatch Help is a service that provides virtual care in the home. We developed that model, it's a national partner, and they will go out to your home and treat you for urgent care conditions to prevent you from either having to go to emergency care and or the ED. They can do that initial assessment as an advanced practitioner and an EMT. They come in with all of their bags of goodies, and they can actually do quite a bit. They can start IVs, they can give eye injections, but they really have a, a plentiful toolkit with them to hopefully keep you at home. If they can't, they will call 911 themselves, stay there till they arrive, do the warning hand off to make sure that the patient is safe and transported. So the beauty of home health is once you have them to your home care for you, um, you are sold. You are just sold on it because it's really a remarkable service and the patient satisfaction is extremely high. The challenge with a model like dispatch health is that you only go to about eight months a day. So it's not terribly efficient in that, that manner in terms of touches of patients. But what it does do is allow patients not to come to the ER. As you may know, our ERs in Southwest Florida are exceedingly busy. You don't want to be there unless you absolutely have to. And so it has helped to decant some of that volume and dignity. But it's a wonderful service that I hope will continue. And I do think it provides value. I just wish we could replicate it in such a way that we could touch more patients with it. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on that? So, so, so I've used it. My wife has used it, and yes, I'm sold. I mean, it, it was the same cost of going to the urgent care, going to the you know less than the emergency room, and they show up at your door, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Again, they started you know the antibiotics or you know recommend they went to the pharmacy, and so it's just that convenience factor. To Chris's point, you know, if we can teleport them to the home. Would be way more scalable, so it's finding that delicate balance. But yeah, it's an amazing service. I'm a shameless plug. I don't, I don't receive anything for it, but again, I've used it personally for my life. Well, it's interesting because uh, the hospital at home study was actually, I think, done by Johns Hopkins, and it found extremely favorable data: a patient satisfaction, decreased complication rate, decreased length of stay. Uh, because the patient got to stay in their own home. So I think hopefully, my hope is over time, Medicare will recognize this as a billable service and it will be scalable at that point. So, but I think we're proving it here that although not super efficient the way it's done now, it really is capable of improving quality care uh, for people where they live, which really offloads the emergency room and hospitals. And that would be uh, a game changer for Southwest Florida. Thank you. Well, uh, I'd certainly like to thank the panel for, for answering our kind of preset questions that I'm already uh, very engaging in response to. But now it's over to you guys. So uh, if there's anyone that would like to ask the panel a question, I will come down with the microphone so that we can um, ask you to ask your question. Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm going to look at Physicians and Mr. Bruce and the key government. I have a couple of them at the point. The state of Florida has 10 accredited medical schools. Uh, only in New York and California have one medical school. It's about 1,500 44 uh, physicians a year. And I'd like to know the number of what. Where are those guys or gals going for training? Why are they coming back to Florida? <laughs> so, um, as we know, there's a medical school and a residency and fellowship training, and that's where we lack capacity on the residency side of Florida. So, in, at Lee Health, and I know NCH has done the same thing. We've developed a family medicine recently an internal medicine residency programs in our facilities so we can keep these students in Florida, train them, hopefully retain them, and we've actually had some decent success. 
So we need more residency programs, and, and the slots need to fill. That's another piece. Students have to want to go into that profession or that specialty. So I think there's more work to be done, but additional residency is very helpful. You know, being a relatively recent resident graduate six years ago, um, I think the one thing that really hinders residents from moving to Southwest Florida is, you know, the cost of living. Uh, it's tough to find a place to live uh, as a resident here. And, you know, I know all the communities are working on that, but that's definitely been tough. But I think there are a lot more uh, residencies popping up throughout Florida. Um, there's a lot of even private for-profit hospitals like HCA are setting up their own residencies to meet the demand. Um, so that is happening. They are, they are doing that. But again, 1,500 uh, physicians a year, that's tough for the whole state of Florida. And I think we do retain many in the state, but it's hard to know if that's enough. Yeah, okay. I, uh... It's kind of interesting to hear you talk about the aging population kind of just that now. And you've also made comments about you know, that they really people of, of an age are becoming much more able to deal with technology. There is an issue though that I was wondering if you ever had any kind of research done, and that is the issue of fear and anxiety. Um, has technology, whether it's telemedicine, any kind of virtual type of connection has that helped in reducing fear and anxiety in the patients? So we've got, you know, I use my mother in law as my benchmark of, you know, she's not a technical, you know, digital native and she's apprehensive. My kids are the ones that program her phone and and so she's my yardstick of what works, of what technology we need to put in place. A lot of that, it's still in today's world, it's not easy. It's close, it's getting there. I think the next generation of technology is ambient. So right now in your home, you have to intentionally, you know, just as we've talked about, you've got to put on the blood pressure cuff, you've got to put on a pulse oximeter, you've got to wear a Fitbit. The next evolution of technology is ambient devices that are you know a smart home or a smart you know room where the devices are there they're part of the room and they're i don't want to say watching but essentially listening for you know they have fall detection they have you know respiration detection so those kind of devices are coming where it's much easier for the patient to say hey this is you know this is what went on and i call it a patient it's really a resident at that point. So that aging well, that's where it becomes that next evolution. But I think from an apprehension, we recognized that early on with COVID. We had to stand up a phone number where patients and I talked to my next door neighbor, 98 years old, had to do a telemedicine visit and she was really concerned. How is this going to work? Am I going to be able to do this? I'm nervous. You know, I know the route to the office, but now I'm picking up my phone. Help me understand. So we stood up a phone number, it's 24 seven, and people call it every day. And that you know, concern, I've, I've got an upcoming visit. And that's a reality that until people have done it a couple times, they need that reassurance, they need that hand holding, and that's okay. Yes, I have a question on the So I'm kind of biased. But the continuity right now, primary care can be horrendous. Cannot see, cannot have to go wide or overwork. Do you have any more extra questions? I mean, hearing the rumors that corporations are going to form groups, businesses, you should say, where they're going to come up with you or somebody and say, I'll provide the department of staff, I'll provide. It's not a woman, it's not a woman, it's not a this is this maybe the fact check this with that question. And my other question is, how in heaven's name are these doctors, where they're doing more work right now, going to be able to keep up with my chart, 
So to answer your first question, I believe it was related to health systems perhaps de developing contracts with outside vendors to come in and manage their physician practices. That's not something we're doing or contemplating. I'm not aware of other health systems that are doing that. Typically, it's the insurance companies that are coming in and buying up the physician's practices. So although there are some groups available, ED, uh, team health, there are some groups out there nationally who provide ED services or hospital services. But for the most part, typically, hospitals will support directly their group. And you're right, it's very difficult to find and, and retain primary care physicians. They're worked out, right? They work incredibly hard. COVID has been extremely difficult. And we have a lot of retirements, folks who would have lasted maybe a couple more years to say they don't have to go out now. Um, we have a lot of younger physicians who, again, want that work life balance, don't want to work full time, so they can be home with their families, which is uh, something we want to support. So it, it is a challenge. Um, what was your spot? Oh, my chart here. Yeah. So um, my chart is a blessing and a curse, depending on who you talk to and how you talk to them. Seriously. I mean, Patients love, I love my job. I do everything in my job. I book appointments, I look at my office notes, order my meds. So from a patient perspective, it does allow patients to get engaged in their care. They're, it is so transparent. The minute you get your labs resulted, you get them. You, you probably would see them before your decision. Again, good and bad, right? So my chart is here to stay, and I think there's value to my chart. What we need to do better is help physicians get through the inbox. Right? The inbox is all the messages and notes that they receive from patients and, and everybody. And it, it's voluminous, it can be. So we've been really working with John and his team to try and develop more streamlined workflows, automate processes, make sure that a note is looked at by a nurse before it goes to a physician so that they're able to triage some of those notes so they don't have a high volume. And primary care is hammered in my chart because they get notes from everybody about everything, right? And a specialist, they really get it about their specialty. So your point is well taken. I think we're improving the process and their patients enjoy it. And again, the other thing I'll mention is that most physicians coming out have no issue with my chart. Zero. Uh, they, they trained on And so that's all they know. So again, I'm starting to see the shift in the digital native. I never heard that. Like that. <laughs> uh, physicians now embracing my chart, but it, it can be challenging. I was just going to say so this is what my team does all day is challenge the balance of my chart. And, you know, I've got the physicians going, we're overwhelmed. And so it's trying to find that right balance of get the, you know, get the message, get the connection to the appropriate person, not just straight to the doctor because then they're overworked. Really a lot of what my team does is how do we avoid the burnout, the challenge so I can't increase upstream the number of providers coming out of med school. I don't, that's not in my purview. But what I can do is, and a lot of the initiatives we're working on is, how do we make the providers extend their time? So be more efficient. Something as simple as a scribe, you know, whether it's a human scribe, so the doctor comes in and is, you know, you've seen this where the doctor is spending the whole time on the computer. And that's frustrating for the patient. It's frustrating for the doctor. They've become, you know, trained, you know, keyboard technicians. So how do we have a scribe, whether it's a physical person, a virtual or artificial intelligence in the room listening to that conversation, who's then doing the dictation? So it eliminates that time and it's the non-value added time. The time with the doctor is precious. You only get that seven, 10 minutes. The rest of the time while you're sitting in the waiting room, while you're waiting you know, in the appointment, that's, there's no value added there. So how can we increase and maximize the time you get to spend with the provider and not burn them out? So they're not staying there until you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. And then we look at something that's called pajama time. So, dirty little secret of, you know, we track that and say, okay, how much time after Dr. Repay goes home at night, he puts the kids to bed and then he gets on his computer to finish those my chart messages. We track that vigilantly and look and say, this is not right. You're spending too much time because now you're going to burn out. And then the same thing from the nurses, how much time 
average nurse spends about 30% actually in direct patient care. The other 70% of that is administrative, is documentation. So could we offload a lot of that to really help? Again, I can't fix upstream how many nurses are coming out of school. But what I can fix is you know, the average lifespan of a nurse. If we could extend that and say, okay, maybe you don't have to sit on, you know, stand all day, but you can focus on, you know, I know Gina, I can't imagine you went to nursing school to document. You probably went to impact patients. So how can we get you more touch time in actually impacting lives? Um, could you answer two questions? In the Astero Life magazine in January, they talked about the development taking place now. For example, Village Center is projected to have about, the uh, Village Center and North Point projected to have about um, 5,000 new home units in those two developments on Court uh, Street on East of 75. They project there could be another 25,000 home units in that area to be developed. So my question is, one question, do you feel your current facilities are capable of handling that growth, or do you have some things in the works that you may not want to say about, but that you have in the works that could go along with the growth that's anticipated? And the second question going back to you, to the, uh, the remote and electronic. Have you seen anything in the area of artificial intelligence that, for example, <clears throat> Sunday morning when I go to church, before I leave the house, my phone tells me what the traffic is going to be like on my way to church because it has developed that pattern. So have you seen anything in the remote ASI is now using more and more artificial intelligence. So I could take the artificial intelligence one, I'll defer on the other. So yes, we're using a lot. A lot of my energy right now is spent on artificial intelligence, um, something called ChatGPT. Uh, you're welcome to Google it, you know, look on CNN. It's basically artificial intelligence and, and to the nth degree. So it's the tip of the iceberg of how efficiently could we manage? So again, I can't produce more physicians. I don't have the capability, but what I can do is equip them with technology. So they can, you know, a lot of the challenges are, you know, you know Dr. Rapace got to, you know, fight insurance and fight, you know, somebody was denied. So now he's got to send off referral letters. He's got to type that note out and that's time consuming. Probably takes some five, seven minutes. If we can automate that process, and again, get him focused on what he went to medical school for, to take care of the patients. So a lot about those things, a lot about, again, what are your active daily, you know, your ADLs, your, you know, what are you doing on a normal daily basis? Can we develop that baseline? So that way, Dr. Pei, and I keep picking on you, sorry, but um, doesn't get plagued with every time, you know, it's a little bit above the norm. Okay, is it above the norm for you or for everybody? So there's a thing called personalized medicine. And that's really where the future is going, saying, okay, the four of us up here are not all equal. We have different habits, different you know, genetics. And, and so how could we personalize it to say, my blood pressure is going to be a little bit different than Chris's. And so that's okay. That's within my normative range. So it's really, again, leveraging technology, leveraging artificial intelligence to create those baselines. So I can provide some information about the work um, in Xero. So we are actually opening up a new practice on uh, University of Highlands in at the end of April. I'm looking at Joan. This is the end of April. Any day, I'm sorry. So we are adding capacity in additional outpatient locations. We're also looking to add capacity in different specialties that are going to be a community health center. So we're trying to restructure that so that we can provide more attention to our oncology coming down in July. So we are making progress. A lot of our capital plan at Lee is related to outpatient services, and so putting different locations in place. That said, I don't know that we can keep up, frankly. Um, it's no different than the school system and the sewer system and the water. You know, it's all related. And I think we're making good headway. I know NCH is doing the same. 
Um, but it's, it's a real challenge to have enough locations. Um, where has the continuing care community um, been, uh, program been into the picture? And does the, um, the community have a responsibility there? Yeah. And my question kind of I have to do with one of the colleagues that was unable to get the funding to build that community in the sterile. So I wonder if it does fit into the medical picture, it's an important part, and the community also has an important part to make sure that those communities are available. That's a very uh, complex question, and it's very difficult when we have to move from acute care to a rehab or a SNF or find, uh, find a place of living for somebody who can't get back to their you know, former baseline. That's, uh, I think the communities, at least Cuyahoga County, I think does a, does a fairly good job of, of triaging that, although, especially this time of year in the season, it's harder to find beds. Um, but, you know, again, as a former hospital doctor where that's what I did every day, uh, we were able to do that. And I think all the powers that be took the responsibility uh, to make that happen. Um, although it didn't always mean that it was the, I, the, the choice that was preferable, but at least it was a safe choice. So I think going forward as the population grows, um, there will continue to be those challenges. But I think all the healthcare systems are very uh, interested in finding those solutions. Number one, because it's right by patient care, but number two, the most expensive place to be uh, is an acute bed, acute care hospital bed. So for all reasons, it's really positive for to get folks to that next appropriate place. And I think all of Southwest Florida is doing a, a very good job of figuring that out, but I don't know that there's anything particularly concrete because there's so many entities. They're like, it's not like any hospital system, healthcare <clears throat> system can, can do all of that. You, you have to use outside uh, companies that run those facilities and they have to have agreements. Um, you know, we've often thought that if we could harness all of the retired physicians and nurses who come down here, and live in gated communities, right? To develop a model where you can take care of your neighbors, right? And so you, you round, you do whatever you need to do, keep an eye on your elderly neighbor, um, maintain contact with their family. So I think there are creative ways that we can function as a CCR of taking care of residential facility, which is where you go and you can get into SNES long-term care. I think we can model that in our own native communities because we have a unique set of circumstances. We've got very talented people who want to contribute, and we have a lot of folks in need who, if they were checked on in a day or two, uh, would make a difference for them. I just have several comments to say. First of all, infrastructure in the state of Florida, particularly the influx of people, is seriously black, and you know it's not just a medical side of it. It is roads, schools, you can just go down the list. You need to pay attention to what's happening in Tallahassee and the, and the several bills that are up there being discussed. And they're trying to just push through and allow major infrastructure and all these condominium kind of buildings, and we don't have the structure. You have to have the schools, the hospitals, the doctors. Uh, the roads, I mean, yes, 
Um, we joke about 41 being our uh, blood pressure uh, <laughs> guidelines, our stress test, because it so is. And you know, we lived here for seven years, and population of any experience is almost doubled within the seven years. And it's just going to keep getting worse. So you really need to stand up and be a part of your community, community and fight for what you believe in and what you need. We just can't be overrun by politicians. We need the basic structure before we can develop. Otherwise, we're going to be hurt. And we are. What's going to happen to the Dominion Beach Road? That's going to become a double double road because there's no place for growth except to go up. And then I would like to make a comment on my chart. Fabulous invention. Love it. And it's just really fantastic. And the doctors being overworked. Oh, yeah, because I've gotten text messages to my doctor at midnight. I know why I'm up. I'm busy reading. He's got no business being up. He should be with his family or in the doors sleeping for the next tough day that's coming his way. So, yeah, and we have, we have these. My husband has had several major heart attacks. First time around was at my heart surgery. We had somebody coming in every day when he came home to check his blood pressure and everything else to make sure that he was walking around being mobile. This last time, he came home with a light vest, and boy, did that make my life comfortable because I didn't have to worry about that. If, if the alarm went off, we knew what to do, we were going to get telephone calls. So, yeah, I love what's happening. Sure. I don't think you would like to actually make a comment about physician extenders going away with first practitioners and physician assistants. You know, historically, we just started out that those extenders, the PAs and the nurse practitioners, had to basically be signed off every time they saw a patient. Uh, Basically, there's a physician's name on the chart. That was done with the idea that that was uh, hopefully doing quality care. Now, I think things have moved away from that. And because for many, many reasons, we just don't want to work with uh, understand, I think the PAs and nurse practitioners are practicing without much oversight. Now, that may be wrong, but I will tell you that as a physician, many people, friends come to me and say, hey, I just want to see a or a This is what he or she told me. Does that make sense to you? Do you think I'm taking good care or whatever? So I'm seeing there's an inherent distrust in thought about the quality of care given by PAs and nurse practitioners. Because they don't think they're supervised. Uh, now, you know, it's, uh, basically, if they are well supervised, I think that probably a couple of times, all the people in the area to make the population understand that these are, these extenders are not practicing alone, they're being supervised, and someone's got a handle on what exactly is happening. It may not be real important for simple, but for more serious diseases, I think there clearly needs a physician to hold uh, I think there's just going to be one more question that we take, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. So. Uh, thank you for such a good I appreciate it. Uh, I'm experiencing some of the transitions firsthand because my primary gift, which is sold out to a, a lot of group recently, and the transition has been a bit challenging. So, one of the questions I have with regards to the inter interdisciplinary group talking about if, if I were to go into such uh, an environment there to help, how easy is it to change members of the team? So, I don't like the like cardiologist, so the primary. How easy is it to find someone else who's in the group with different difficulties? So, 
you can change. You have every right to see the position that you connect with and, and you trust. And we do have instances where somebody meets a position and it just doesn't hit it off and then they go to a position's partner. That never used to be done back in the day. When you had a position, you had a position. I think now it's more flexible in just the right direction. The issue is availability, frankly. And uh, so you would could do it, but you may have to wait. Again, depending on the circumstances, if it's an urgent issue or not, but it is possible to do that. I would talk to your primary care physician about what you like in the doctor or what you don't like. You know, you, they can help figure out who might be the best person for you based on their knowledge of you. And, and what you're looking for. So I think it's worthwhile to have that conversation before you get referred. Uh, I like this, I like male, female, I want somebody in this age group, you know, whatever. Um, they may be trying to direct you, which could be helpful. For someone right in thinking, uh, there's someone particularly who's part of the wrong group, but they had um, Either an idea that they did want to go to a physician specifically that didn't exist within that group, but there isn't anything specifically to prevent them doing that. No, so so it's all it's patient choice. So if you have an existing relationship with an independent physician in town, and even if you pay to a health system primary care physician, absolutely you should maintain that relationship. Yeah. Patient yeah. choice. Well, I'd like to uh, roll into yeah, 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 one more quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what was that? Oh, you back to you. Uh oh, all right. It'll take one moment. When I tried to help my voice to start projecting from the beginning, you said a lot of this with the mergers and consolidations and everything. Things became more of a business plan. Um, and that does help with profitability. And then bringing physicians in to that plan, um, and then they're more working for the insurance company or the insurance company consolidated business. What is being done to make anyone want to go into the medical field? You know, we're short on nurses, we're short on doctors. Is that progressing? But, you know, originally when people went into medicine, it was because they had a call, like they wanted to take care of people. They wanted to be with people. They wanted one-on-one. -on -one. And now there's a phenomenon with the data, you know, what can be done and what is being done. But then why would someone go into medicine? So I see it as sort of a cyclical thing that we will just progress with AI and no one will ever go into medicine. Well, from the nursing standpoint, we are actually spending a lot of time at the high schools, um, starting with middle school, high school, to really cultivate that um, curiosity about healthcare. We have to start now to plan for the future, absolutely. So I think that point is, is well made. I mean, I still think that when you're young and you have an interest in science and maybe some mentoring from either family members or other individuals you know that talk to you about medicine and helping people, that it does still come to that. Now I will say once you get out, if you look at the burnout rates in medicine, uh, they are going up, they're as high as ever, uh, uh, you know, for all the reasons that we all can think about. Um, and I think we're all trying to solve that. I mean, I can tell you, uh, I'm mainly affiliated with NCH and they go to great lengths to put on physician wellness retreats and do surveys to try to figure out how to facilitate. So I think it's an ongoing challenge nationwide for the shortage issue and the EMR issue and how to get folks involved with that. But um, I don't know that we have a good answer there. I, I honestly don't yet. I think everyone is trying uh, to find a way to make it continue to be an attractive profession. Um, but I think we're, that chapter is yet to be written, I will say. 
Um, I will close the exam in just a moment, but I thought your question was interesting, and I'd just like to add a, a comment of mine, if I may, to answer it. Um, over the course of my career, I've actually had uh, the opportunity to speak to thousands of physicians in the work that I did in Northern Research in the healthcare field. And I think that what I've learned is that over the period of time, uh, as was mentioned during the, uh, the discussions, physicians have felt that they've just become so overloaded and burned out with the demands that are placed on them that many of them just feel that you know they have to give up or it dissuades those uh, who have been trained maybe from going into certain parts of the medical field. And one of the key areas which I think is also uh, a factor in this, and it's not going to be dealt with very easily, is that within the United States, and it's not the only country that has this problem, but perhaps it's rather more extreme here, is the fact that about a third of the amount of money that is spent in healthcare is on administrative issues and are not directed specifically at helping you know, healthcare for the population. And I think that is a, a factor that plays in a lot of people's minds that they feel again uh, unhappy that uh, you know there is not more focus, there's not more attention being played to the real reason why people wish to obviously um, provide a service to people like ourselves when we when we are ill. That's what I would just add personally to your question. But it is my pleasure to uh, draw the meeting to a close and to thank you as the audience for your very, very interesting questions on top of the ones uh, that we obviously asked on the podium. Uh, my grateful thanks goes to our panel, and I really would like to ask you to express your appreciation for what they've done to you. I would have, of course, like our audience to have been a rather bigger one this evening, but uh, what we will be doing here from the Gage Ferris standpoint is we have the recording. Uh, that will be provided on our website, and I know that a lot of people who might not have been able to play it tonight uh, will want to listen to this. Uh, the other thing which we will do, and as my particular position in the uh, communications part of the Age of Stereo organization, uh, there were so many very, very important things as we touched on tonight uh, that we will be providing a written report, not of course as the full proceedings, but certainly with very important snippets uh, that were taken away from what I thought was a very engaging discussion. Um, the other comment that was made about the various things that are happening in the area and the people's requirements for more action to the politicians, either in Tallahassee or to the county or indeed to our local uh, village council. Engage Sarah is very much the organization that really does want to listen to what you feel is important and how we might be able to address some of your concerns. That is actually what Engage Sarah is all about, and was formerly, as you said, uh, the ECCL has made so many important changes, uh, which allows us to be in a very enjoyable uh, environment that we experience here. We aim to continue to do that for you. So please reach out to us either through our paper, either through our website, or through uh, uh, emails or telephone calls, uh, and help us to, to know how best to can serve you. So just to finalize, I'd again like to thank uh, the principal of the school and the school staff for all of their work in helping us to put this on here this evening. Uh, to my colleagues, uh, there are many people, uh, Mike Wilson, uh, Terry Flanagan, and of course, Harold Hill, uh, who have done so much work behind the scenes. That takes a lot to put this on and to, uh, to, to have this excellent meeting uh, run its course this evening. Um, one thing uh, you may be given if you haven't got one, 
Uh, please take a question there, and if you have one, there is a box at the uh, corner there on the table on the right hand side as you leave. There are also some brochures from the help, uh, and if you didn't see them on the way in, also from uh, our engaged sterile organization, uh, which you can pick up on the way out. But it is very useful to us to have your comments from the, uh, the short question I wrote to, to complete that. And uh, again, safe ride home, everyone, and thank you so much for your attendance tonight.